This talk is on counterexamples to new circular security assumptions underlying indistinguishability obfuscation. It's joint work by me, Sam Hopkins, Ayush Jain, and Rachel Lin. So as a starting point, let's introduce indistinguishability obfuscation. All we need to know for this talk is that it's an extremely useful cryptographic primitive, and uh, provably secure constructions of indistinguishability obfuscation imply um, secure constructions of and a tremendous wealth of exciting cryptographic primitives. So um, indistinguishability obfuscation, or IO, has been the object of intense study for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, and only very recently has, it, has there been a construction of IO which can be proved secure based on relatively standard assumptions. So for at least a decade, IO proved to be an incredibly elusive uh, target, an incredibly elusive goal to construct uh, in a provably secure fashion. Now, um, looking back on the history of IO constructions, a perhaps kind of pessimistic um, point of view on them is that the field has been engaged in a sort of uh, cat and mouse game in which um, heuristic constructions were proposed and then they were attacked, which led to further heuristic constructions, then attacks, then more constructions, and so on. And um, although now we have the benefit of hindsight, at the time, it may well have looked like this was just not going anywhere, that we were just going in circles. Um, but a more charitable interpretation, and I think with the benefit of hindsight, one that you can easily argue for, is that even though um, it might have looked like we were going in circles with these cat, this sort of cat and mouse game, Actually, um, underneath it all, there was a notion of progress. Uh, the progress, the notion of progress was that um, the kind of heuristic assumptions that were used underlying these constructions uh, got simpler and simpler and simpler over time until eventually, uh, about a year ago now, or a little bit more, this supposed cat and mouse game actually led to a provably secure construction of, of I.O. based on um, these standard few assumptions by Jane Lin and Sahai. So this construction uh, and story is not the main subject of the talk, but it sets the background for what we're going to try to, uh, what we're going to try to do and what the aims of our paper are. So now that we know one provably secure assumption of I.O., um, we have, there are a couple of natural goals. First, the Jane Lin Sahai construction it does not use uh, uses assumptions which are known to be not quantum secure. So it would be good if we could now find um, constructions of I/O that are secure in a post-quantum world. Furthermore, the Jane Lin Sahai construction is pretty complicated, and so it would be very nice to have simpler constructions of indistinguishability obfuscation. Towards both of these goals, a natural approach is to try to base IO on only lattice-based assumptions. Because lattice-based assumptions are typically secure against quantum attacks or are thought to be secure against quantum attacks, this can lead to post-quantum secure IO. Um, and if we can get rid of many of the assumptions that are underlying the J, uh, Jane Lin Sahai scheme, we could hope that the resulting construction will be simpler. Towards this goal, we've seen several um, exciting recent works which describe new simple I.O. constructions, um, which while not being provably secure under uh, well-studied assumptions, do, uh, do manage to state very clean, um, attackable, verifiable assumptions uh, that, uh, under which they can prove security of their schemes. So these new, uh, these new schemes are due to Brukowski, Dotlangarg, Malavolta, Gay and Pass, and, and We and Wix. And um, especially these second two uh, state very nice compact assumptions under which they can prove security of their schemes. And these assumptions are basically lattice-based. So while they're not just standard learning with errors, they seem to be relatively small modifications of uh, learning with errors style assumptions. And both of them uh, modify the learning with errors assumptions in similarly flavored ways. Uh, and I'm gonna spend the next few minutes describing how those modifications go. So the, both of them have an assumption of the flavor of learning with errors 
plus some kind of circular security, plus some kind of uh, leakage of some, informa some, some randomness of encryption to the attacker. And both these papers, Gay and Pass and We and Wix, show that um, under this kind of LWE++ assumption, uh, they can get provably secure I.O. So that's very exciting. Uh, it suggests that there is an avenue to simple and post-quantum secure I.O. under which would be based just on lattice problems. Um, but it now means that it's imperative to try to analyze this type of assumption, right? We need to understand if these assumptions are secure or if they're not, how can they be modified to be secure and how can we modify the constructions accordingly um, towards the aim of post-quantum secure I.O. and simpler constructions. So uh, our paper um, is crypto analyzing assumptions of, of this flavor. So now I can say our results in a nutshell. Uh, our result, you know, now, now we are, as we described, uh, as I described earlier in the talk, in this, um, you know, construction attack, construction attack type cycle, we're in the attack part of the cycle and, and our results uh, are a crypto analytic attack on these assumptions, the ones, the particular instantiations of this flavor of assumption that are in the gay pass and we and Wix work. And we show that the, the assumptions in those works as stated are false. So we give, um, we give attacks on those assumptions. However, to be clear, the underlying strategy and constructions of all of these papers are not broken by our work. And in particular, the, the strategy that they give for constructing IO from lattices may well be, um, may well be feasible. It may well be possible to give a uh, construction of IO based on this, this strategy. Uh, it just means that the formulation of the assumptions that are underlying them have to be modified. So our hope, as we described before, is that these attacks can lead to um, refined and ideally secure versions of these assumptions um, and, uh, and eventually to post-quantum secure IO. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus in on just the one, one of these two constructions, the, the work by Gay and Pass, um, and our attack on the assumption of we and Wix is relatively similar. Okay, so let's fix in our minds a nice, whatever that means, fully homomorphic encryption scheme. For instance, for this talk, we can think just about the Gentry Sahai Waters uh, GSW FHE scheme. As I said, the gay pass assumption has this kind of LWE++ flavor, LWE plus some other stuff. So let's go through the other stuff. The other stuff has two components. The first, is a circular security type of assumption. So let's review circular security. Um, circular security is the notion that if so-called um, key cycles uh, are released to an attacker, that the attacker cannot benefit from this. So suppose this is, this is a two circular security assumption here on this slide. Suppose that in addition to uh, suppose that we that we um, set up two copies of an FHE scheme with a secret key one uh, and public key one, uh, secret key two and public key two, and then we publish the following two uh, uh, ciphertexts. We publish an encryption of public key one on sorry an encryption of secret key two rather under public key one, and an encryption of secret key one under public key two. Um, it's believed that even given these ciphertexts, the underlying FHE schemes remain secure, uh, at least for natural FHE schemes such as GSW. And in fact, this belief underlies the security of unleveled fully homomorphic encryption. So uh, whether or not you consider this a well-founded assumption, not completely clear, but it is at least widely enough believed that we are willing to rely on it for unleveled FHE. So that's, uh, that's circular security. The second type of assumption is um, 
we're going to call randomness leakage, the second plus in the LWE++. So this requires a little bit more uh, setup to describe formally, but the idea is that the attacker gets to see some of the randomness of encryption that results when um, the FHE scheme is run on, when, when the FHE scheme um, does some evaluations of a, uh, of, a, of a circuit on some chosen plain text or on some chosen, yeah, chosen plain text. So uh, the way that this is instantiated in the work of Gay and Pass, they call the shielded, shielded randomness leakage. And I'll go ahead and describe what that means. So here's the usual um, security game or almost the usual security game um, for CPA security, uh, except with this modified line here. So as in the usual security game, the adversary chooses two messages, M0 and M1, and then uh, a bit 01 is uniformly randomly sampled and the attacker gets to see the encryption of, um, of the message MB, so either M0 or M1. The goal is for the attacker to guess which one of the messages uh, she, has, she has seen. Um, but before doing so, she can call a certain oracle that Gay and Pass call the SRL oracle, a polynomial number of times. So what is this oracle? This is the oracle that is going to give uh, give her access to some kind of information about randomness of encryption after FHE evals. Here's the SRL oracle O. Whenever the SRL oracle is called, a fresh encryption of zero under some randomness of encryption R star is generated. Let's call that ciphertext CT star. Now, the adversary chooses, given CT star, which she gets to see, the adversary chooses some circuit um, F which takes messages and outputs Boolean values. The idea is that the adversary is going to get to see some leakage on randomness of encryption that res results when uh, FHE eval is run on uh, using, using uh, the circuit F. So when the circuit F is homomorphically evaluated. What the Oracle does is homomorphically evaluates uh, the circuit F on the message MB and then it leaks a certain block of randomness. The randomness should have the following property. So the randomness that it leaks is composed of two parts, R star, um, which is this randomness of encryption from the, uh, from the fresh encryption of zero. This is hiding the more interesting piece of randomness, R sub F. So what is R sub F? R F is randomness that if you used it as the randomness of encryption for the message f of mv, if you encoded f of mv under this randomness rf, you would get the same randomness of encryption as you do uh, when you run eval on f and, uh, and mv. So you can think of rfct star as the randomness that is uh, sitting in the ciphertext that you would get if you run eval um, on f and mv. Uh, if you just leaked this randomness alone, it would be easy to then recover, um, it would be easy to break this the scheme. So it's hidden, it's um, shielded by this other randomness R star. Okay, so this is a little bit complicated, but the basic idea is that the adversary gets to see some leakage on the randomness of encryption uh, that results from running FHE eval on a chosen circuit F of CT star, or F, uh, yeah, F, which depends on CT star. It depends on the ciphertext that um, itself depends on the shielding randomness R star. Okay, so it turns out that actually this shielding works, um, at least if you consider it in isolation. So uh, Gain Pass show that if you ignore circular security and you just think of uh, LWE plus this, this kind of randomness leakage, this uh, SRL um, oracle, this is actually secure if the FHE scheme you use is GSW um, under the uh, learning with errors assumption. So where have we arrived? Basically, we have this LWE++ assumption, this whole thing. Um, if you look at LWE++ one of them, circular security, we reasonably think that that uh, is secure, at least we base unleveled FHE on that assumption. If you look at LWE++ the other one, randomness leakage, it's provably secure under LWE, at least for a natural crypto scheme like GSW. And so it's kind of reasonable to think that you could add 
both of these assumptions at the same time and still get IO. Indeed, that is the conjecture that Gay and Pass put forward. So they call this the uh, OSRL circ conjecture. And it goes like this. It says that for natural FHE schemes S, such as GSW, um, if S is two circular secure and S is uh, SRL secure, then it's secure with both kinds of leakages simultaneously, the encrypted key cycle and the SRL oracle leakages. We show that this conjecture is false um, by using, a, as a counterexample, GSW. We'll construct an attack when the FHE scheme is GSW. Um, some previous versions of our work, which, which circulated, uh, used instead of vanilla GSW, a slightly modified GSW scheme, which we still counted as natural, but um, actually we're able to conduct this attack even when the, when the scheme is just regular old GSW. No modifications are necessary. So for the rest of the talk, I'll go ahead and describe our attack. So here's how it goes. Remember that what the attacker gets to see um, is, for starters, let's say the ciphertext of the um, of, of MB, they get to see the encryption of the chosen plain text, and they get to see a key cycle. And what they get to do is choose a circuit. So when they call this SRL Oracle, we're going to call the SRL Oracle. Um, they get to choose this circuit that maps messages to 0, 1. And the choice of circuit gets to depend on two things. It gets to depend on CT star, the ciphertext, uh, which is a fresh encryption of 0 under randomness R star that's going to get used for shielding. And the circuit gets to depend on the key cycle. And then the, we, our attacker, our attack gets to observe this um, shielded randomness leakage, RF minus R star, where RF is going to contain some interesting information, but it's shielded by R star. So how are we going to choose this circuit? Um, our choice of the circuit is going to use the, fir the following uh, first observation. So here, just to introduce some notation, I'm going to write um, the private key of the main crypto system that uh, uh, MB is encrypted under as U, and um, R will is a R is you know a matrix that is randomness of encryption for uh, for for the message MB. So the first observation is that if we choose certain gates in F, we can make FHE eval of F move some information about the message MB into the randomness, um, into the randomness of encryption. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and assume that MB is just a single bit, so zero or one. And let's notice that if we just multiply the bit by zero uh, and as, our, as our circuit, and then we FHE eval on, on that, uh, what will happen is that we're gonna move information about MB into the randomness part of the encryption. So under GSW, uh, this is what would happen if you do that multiplication. So here is our ciphertext of, M of MB. It's uh, private key, or sorry, public key times randomness plus uh, message times a gadget matrix. To multiply by zero, we multiply by, uh, by this thing. This is just some, some encryption of zero. And if you do the multiplication, what you get is, uh, the public key times some big matrix. Uh, this is now the randomness of encryption in the in the new resulting ciphertext. And notice that MB is sitting in here. Some other stuff is sitting here too, but but MB is sitting here. Now, um, this seems nice. And notice that if we if we use this as our circuit F, then when we do do the SRL oracle, we will get to observe this matrix. Uh, but the whole point of the, sh of the shielding is that it's actually fine if we see this matrix. Like it's not gonna break security because we're not gonna get to see this matrix directly. Instead, it's going to be shielded by this additional randomness R star. The second key idea is that in the presence of the encrypted key cycle, we can use the key cycle to access R star inside our function F. Okay, because F is going to be homomorphically evaluated, um, F can take as sort of an additional hard-coded input, uh, we can think of F as taking the private key for, um, 
for the crypto scheme because it has access to a cipher text of that private key. So this is actually, this is the key idea. Um, once you have this idea, implementing the attack, there are probably several ways to do it. Um, and I'm just going to describe one way to do it, but we, there should be, there should be several ways to do it once you, once you decide to use the key cycle to access the, um, the shielding randomness. So here's, here's the way we do it. Um, we use inside F, we use the secret key one, which is encrypted in our key cycle under public key two, so F can, uh, F can depend on secret key one. So what we'll do is run a um, decryption algorithm, the GSW decryption algorithm inside the circuit F, because uh, F gets to depend on the secret key, and we'll decrypt the um, ciphertext CT star, which gives us access to the, the shielding randomness R star, in fact, what we can get is not exactly this randomness itself, but we'll get it times some short vector. This is like the short vector that comes out of GSW decryption. Um, and now if we take the inner product of that vector with some chosen vector V, we can get, we can after, after the SRL leakage, we can get something that looks like the following. So we're going to compose this trick with the trick I described earlier, where we multiply by zero to move some information about the message part of an encryption over into the randomness part of an encryption. What we'll get is um, some junk plus something useful. So bef we have, before, when we used this trick, we had just message bit times some, uh, some randomness R. Now we're going to get message bit plus uh, this, in, this, this thing about R star. And then there's the shielding randomness R star, which will show up before the SRL thing gets released. Now what we need to do is get rid of this other kind of garbage. The useful thing is that we know this matrix here, the gadget matrix applied to some ciphertext that we know. And so, and we had the freedom to choose this vector V. So what we can do is choose a vector V, which is in the kernel of this matrix. It's a Boolean matrix that's random. So it has a non-trivial kernel with decent probability, like one half. Um, and that, that means that what we can actually find uh, by, by doing this is this term will vanish and we will be left only with this stuff. Okay, so what we can get after the SRL uh, leakage is something like this. Um, what, we'll, what we can then do, it turns out, uh, without going into too much detail, is um, use things like this to build a linear system which is solved by the short vector E, okay? So at the end of the day, the attack goes as follows. The, um, the attacker calls the SRL oracle uh, on some, with some carefully chosen circuit, which includes the GSW decryption algorithm and then uses this trick to multiply by zero, which moves information about uh, message over into the randomness. The adversary gets the randomness leakage. Um, the, this has been carefully chosen so that the shielding um, interacts in a known way with the, with the message that's hiding in the shielded part of the randomness leakage. And then the adversary uses the result to set up a linear system and uh, the linear system will have a solution if the message bit is zero and it will not have a solution if the message bit is one. And um, that way the, the adversary can break the crypto scheme. So, just some brief conclusions. So where, where, uh, where did we end up with? So um, we were studying IO constructions, candidate IO constructions based only on lattice style assumptions. And these assumptions, um, they have this LWE plus plus flavor, plus two things, LWE plus a circular security assumption and plus some randomness leakage on FHE evals, both of which on their own seem plausibly secure. But we show that when you put these two kinds of leakages together, at least the way that it's, uh, the way it's done concretely in these papers by Gay and Pass and We and Wix, um, the, the resulting assumption is attackable. And in, in general, you know, sort of the conclusion we draw is that the, uh, there's not, at least as far as we can tell, there's not a sort of general um, principle that security of these leakages on their own implies security together. Uh, instead, the security of an assumption like this is going to have to be sensitive to a lot of details about the structure of the leakages. So of course, a natural next question is whether one can get a more specific version of this, um, 
of this assumption, whether you can instantiate an assumption like this in a way that avoids the attacks that we're describing. And there is um, some work in this direction by uh, this set of authors that I think will be publicly available uh, shortly. Um, and of course, you know, it's not just whatever construction is proposed here. It may be possible to give many other constructions which avoid our attack, and it's very interesting to try and do so.